This week's reading in Come Follow Me is 2 Nephi 26 through 30. But I have broken into two different segments just because of the length of the presentation and the abundance of doctrine that is taught in these chapters of 2 Nephi. And so this first part we will consider 2 Nephi chapters 26 through 27. So let's begin with 2 Nephi 26. But here's just a quick overview of 2 Nephi 26 through 29. Chapters 26 through 29 recount Nephi's vision of the future. Paramount in the vision was the visit of the resurrected Christ to the Nephites. Nephi testified that before that visit, however, God would cleanse the Americas of the wicked such that only the more righteous part of the people would be spared to behold and be taught by the Lord. Those who cast out the prophets, those who had stoned and killed the Lord's spokesman, these would die in their sins and be ushered into hell, which is reserved for the imp impenitent, meaning those who do not repent. Thus was the second time that Nephi had described the death and destructions in America that were to be those cataclysmic events instant to the coming of Christ. Just as the golden era of the Nephites, 4th Nephi, is but a type of the great millennial day, which will be enjoyed by all the faithful on earth, so also are the destructions in America at the time of the Savior's death a type of the ultimate destruction of the ungodly at the time of the second advent. For more details on that, you can see 3 Nephi 8. I forgot to mention at the beginning, I didn't have as much time as I wanted to to proofread this, so... I apologize for any typo errors that we may come across. So let's begin with 2 Nephi chapter 26. 26 1, the phrase, the words which he shall speak shall be the law, meaning Christ's word is law, it is gospel. Nephi would later explain to his people concerning the gospel or the doctrine of Christ. He taught his people that there will be no more doctrine given until after Christ shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. Once the master appeared to the Nephites, he announced the fulfillment of the law of Moses and identified himself as the law. 26 verse 3, the phrase signs given unto my people. The promise of a sign of confirmation is typical of divine instruction. Christ himself decreed that the coming forth of the Book of Mormon would be the sign of the Father's work, the work of gathering in the last days. In his instruction to Joseph Smith, Moroni promised him a sign by which he may know that all that had been promised him would come to pass. Many would seek to overthrow his work, but it would increase the more it was opposed. Boy, we've seen that happen, haven't we? Events of such transcendent magnitude as the birth, death, and resurrection of Messiah must not go unnoticed and unannounced. The phrase, they perish because they cast out the prophets and the saints. Thus, they would die in their sins. This also shows that one of the qualifications of being considered the righteous is heeding the words of the prophets and faithful communion with the saints of God. We talk about the righteous, and this will happen to the righteous, and the righteous, this will happen. And, and so it's good to know, well, what is considered the righteous? Am I righteous? Who are the righteous? And one aspect of the righteous are those who do not cast out prophets, nor do anything to harm the saints. And that would be spiritually or physically harm them. Chapter 26, verse 4, the phrase, All those who are proud and do wickedly, the day that cometh shall burn them up. 
Nephi quotes again the prophet Zenos, just as Malachi would do some 200 years hence. In this case, however, Nephi applies Zenos' prophecy of destruction of the wicked at the time of the second coming of Christ to the cataclysms preceding his appearance to the Nephites. In doing so, Nephi utilizes one of his own cardinal principles of scriptural interpretation, that of likening the scriptures and making application of one oracle to separate separate but related events, all of this stemming from pride. President Ezra Taft Benson warned, the central feature of pride is enmity, enmity towards God and enmity towards our fellow men. Enmity means hatred towards, hostility to, or a state of opposition. It is the power by which Satan wishes to reign over us. Pride is essentially competitive in nature. We pit our will against God's. When we direct our pride towards God, it is in the spirit of my will, not thine be done. As Paul said, they seek their own, not the teachings which are Jesus Christ. Pride is a damning sin in the true sense of that word. It limits or stops progression. The proud are not easily taught. They won't change their minds to accept truths because to do so implies that they have been wrong. Pride affects all of us at various times and in various degrees. Now you can see why the building in Lehi's dream that represents the pride of the world was large and spacious, and great was the multitude that entered into it. Pride is the universal sin, the great vice. Yes, pride is the universal sin, the great price. The antidote for pride is humility, meekness, submissiveness. It is the broken heart and contrite spirit. End of President Benson's quote. Isn't it interesting, brothers and sisters, that those in the great and spacious building, the world can make some beautiful things. Isn't it interesting that instead of spending their time in this great, spacious, beautiful building, they all spend their time outside pointing to those partaking of the fruit? Why are they so obsessed with them? Why don't they enjoy the building? Again, as some have said, like Elder Maxwell, they seem to leave the gospel in the church, but they just can't seem to leave it alone. They constantly have to be pointing. 26, 5 through 6. They that kill the prophets. That phrase. Great destruction waits those who kill the prophets and the saints, for the fire of the anger of the Lord shall be kindled against them. This does not have to be just actual physical, but could also refer metaphorically to those who seek the death of God's prophets and saints through false educational ideas, philosophies, and false accusations against them. Their destruction is a type of the same destruction that will come upon the, come upon the wicked at the second coming of Christ. Boy, we see that destruction and killing of the prophets and the saints through false philosophies and educational ideas, DEI, critical race theory, transgenderism. These are all things that kill the teachings of the truth of the prophets and try to destroy the spirituality of the saints. Chapter 26, verse 7, the phrase, O oh, the pain and the anguish of my soul. It is instructed to compare Nephi's mourning in 600 B.C. in behalf of his distant prosperity to those of Mormon who witnessed with anguish and destruction of the Nephite nation in A.D. 385 and the earlier lamentation of Enoch over the wickedness in the days of Noah. 26 verse 8, the phrase, the righteous look forward unto Christ with steadfastness. There is steadiness and quiet maturity that characterizes the righteous. Their vision of the Lord and of his work is undimmed by struggles and competing circumstances. The faithful who lived before the many of time were taught to look to God and live, to believe in Christ and live the principles of his gospel as though he had already come. The spiritual minded who lived during his mortal ministry excuse me, recognized Jesus of Nazareth for what he was, the God of their fathers and the promised Messiah. 
Those with an eye of faith who have lived since the first century gladly acknowledge the mission and ministry of Christ as the pivotal moment in all of history and seek with eagerness to be ready for the day of the second advent, which will come upon the wicked as a thief in the night. All righteous people of all ages, those who have offered sacrifice in the similitude of the great sacrifice of the Son of God and had suffered tribulation in their Redeemer's name, those who have departed the mortal life firm in the hope of a glorious resurrection, these have learned to read the signs of the times given in their own day and have thereby come unto Christ and his church. Here Nephi gives us more insight into who are considered the righteous. So all those who are steadfastness looking forward to Christ would be considered the righteous. Second Nephi 9, the phrase, the son of righteousness shall appear, meaning, again, Nephi appears to be applying the words of Zena, spoken in the first instance with reference to the second coming, and later quoted by Malachi to the coming of Jesus Christ to the Nephites. Chapter 26, verse 10, the phrase, they sell themselves for naught, meaning, what shall a man or woman give in exchange for their soul? Of what value is a divine birthright? Is anything which we may purchase or exhort it in this fallen sphere worth eternal life? Our fame, wealth, title, or power worth the battering of one's value, bartering of one's values? Satan's first article of faithfulness has been repeated with creed, creedal clarity since the beginning. One can buy anything in this world for money. It is a hellish philosophy, and those who operate in harmony with it sell that which is priceless for a paltry sum. Such a scene, acted out in fastian fashion every day, is both pitiful and pathetic. Our modern, our modern counterpart is the foolish search for fulfillment in fads and fashions, in the neglect of God, ordained roles, and the flight from covenant obligations. They must go down to hell. Those who live a celestial life on earth and do not repent must suffer in the spirit world to be eligible for the celestial kingdom. Hell is the gate into the celestial kingdom. The NC 76, 81 through 85 says, And again we saw the glory of the celestial, which glory is that of the lesser, even the glory of the stars, differs from that of the glory of the moon and the firmament. These are they who receive not the gospel, neither the testimony of Jesus. These are they who do, who do, who deny not the Holy Spirit. These are they who are thrust down to hell. These are they who shall not be redeemed from the devil until the last resurrection, until the Lord, even Christ the Lamb, shall have finished his work. Brothers and sisters, I am, I am convinced there is nothing in this world, money, fame, titles, that is worth giving up exaltation for. A part of hell, I think, will be those who did give up exaltation for the things of the world and now realizing they could have had better. What a searing of the conscience they will have for a thousand years. Chapter 26, verse 11, the phrase, the Spirit of the Lord will not always strive with man means the gift of the Holy Ghost is enjoyed only by those who have been baptized and confirmed members of the church. All men and women are born with the light of Christ or the Spirit of Jesus Christ. One of the manifestations of the light of Christ is conscience, the internal mooring monitoring system by which every soul can know to choose good from evil. If a person attends to the light of conscience within him, he is further directed in righteous paths and led to a greater light and knowledge. If he ignores or rejects the spirit of Jesus Christ and lives after the manner of the world, he will eventually sear his conscience and stifle the promptings towards that which is good and ennobling. Be like Lame Lame, they would be past feeling. The Holy Ghost does not always strive or entice, Elder Bruce Henry Conkey has written. His mission is to testify and teach. But those who heed the enticements and submit to the strivings of the Holy Spirit 
which is the light of Christ, are unable to receive the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. The phrase, then cometh a speedy destruction. In a revelation given to Hiram Smith, the Lord says, Now verily I say unto you, put your trust in that spirit which leadeth to do good, yea, to do justly, to walk humbly, to judge righteously, and this is my spirit. When people respond to their consciences, when they seek after, that should be after, not alter, I apologize. When they seek When they seek after and receive the fruits of the gifts of the Spirit, they naturally find their affections and attentions being focused beyond themselves, animated with desire to establish and perpetuate Zion. They come to dwell in righteousness because of one heart and one mind and see to the needs of those about them. On the other hand, unaided man, Man unilluminated and undirected by that God who holds the destinies of nations and peoples in his hand will ultimately fail in his attempt to establish peace and order in society. He is operating with limited resources. It has been the design of Jehovah, Joseph Smith explained, from the commencement of the world and is his purpose now to regulate the affairs of the world in his own time to stand as a head of the universe and take the reins of government in his own hand. When that is done, judgment will be administered in righteousness. Anarchy and confusion will be destroyed. Other man-made attempts to promote universal peace and happiness have proved abortive. Every effort has failed. Every plan and design has fallen to the ground. It needs the wisdom of God, the intelligence of God, and the power of God to accomplish this. As the Joel P. Worthen of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that the importance of different effort to merit the continued presence of the Holy Ghost, quote, as with all gifts, the gift of the Holy Ghost must be received and accepted to be enjoyed. When priest's hands were laid upon your head to confirm you a member of the church, you heard the words, receive the Holy Ghost. This did not mean that the Holy Ghost unconditionally became your constant companion. Scriptures warn us that the Spirit of the Lord will not always strive with man. When we are confirmed, we are given the right to the companionship of the Holy Ghost. But it is a right that we must continue to earn through obedience and worthiness. We cannot take this gift for granted. End of quote. Chapter 26, verses 12 through 13, the phrase... I spake concerning the convincing of the Jews that Jesus is the very Christ. Moroni wrote on the title page of the Book of Mormon that one of the major reasons the Book of Mormon had been preserved were for the purpose of convincing the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself into all nations. Jesus is, of course, the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. As to this verity, there is wholesale rejection by unconverted Jews, but little dispute among the believing element in modern Christendom. But Jesus Christ is also the eternal God. He is Jehovah. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same eternal being who gave the law to Moses on Sinai. And he is a separate and distinct being from that of his eternal parent, the almighty Elohim. As to these later verities, there is almost universal ignorance in the Christian world. And once again, complete rejection by the Jews who have not come to accept Jesus as the Christ. The Book of Mormon is thus a sacred volume which manifests the identity of the premortal Jehovah, the shepherd of Israel. It establishes beyond question that a God became a man that he condescended to leave his throne divine to take upon him a tabernacle of clay, and that he who was and is the Lord Omnipotent came to earth to suffer and bleed and die to atone for the spiritual and physical death of the human family. This Jesus Christ, this eternal God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, in the sense that he always manifests himself unto those who call on his name in faith and endure in righteousness. 
The Holy Ghost is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek Christ, as well as in times of old, as in times that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world, if it so be that they repent and come unto him. Chapter 26, verse 15, the phrase, My seed shall have been smitten by the Gentiles, and the Lord shall have camped against them. Because the seed of Nephi will have ripened in iniquity, the Lord will send other nations, Gentiles, and peoples to afflict and destroy them. The phrase, The words of the righteous shall be written, and the prayers of the faithful shall be heard, means, in keeping with God's promise to Enos and many of his faithful successors, God would preserve the records which would be known as the Book of Mormon. Yea, and this was their faith, that my gospel, which I gave unto them, that ye might preach in their day, might come unto their brethren the Lamanites, and also that had become Lamanites because of their dissensions. Now this is not all. Their faith and their prayers was that the gospel should be made known also, if it were possible, that other nations should possess this land. And thus they did leave a blessing upon this land in the, the, their prayers, that whosoever should believe in this gospel in this land might have eternal life, yea, that it might be free unto all of whatsoever nation, kindred, tongue, or people may be. Doctrine and Covenants 10, 48-52. The phrase, those who have dwindled in unbelief shall not be forgotten, means the Book of Mormon contains a record of a fallen people. The Nephite and Jaredite civilization, civilizations serve as a reminder that even the mightiest of nations will come to ruin if they do not remember their God. Chapter 26, verse 16, the phrase, their speech shall be low out of the dust, meant... Where else in history, Elder Bruce R. McConkie asked, are there two better examples of people who were brought down and utterly destroyed than the Jaredites and Nephites, and whose voices shall be stilled in death, yet they speak from their graves for all to hear? Does not their united voice have a familiar spirit? Is it not whispering out of the ground the same prophetic message that is now and always has been the burden of the fling of the The fleeing prophets, I'm not sure that's the right word, and I'm not sure which one it is. I apologize. Does not the Book of Mormon become a familiar message, one already written in the Bible? The phrase familiar spirit means the true, the phrase familiar spirit is used in biblical texts, refer to necromancy or the attempted practice of communion with the dead. An alternate rendering for familiar spirits is ghosts, or as we would know it, spirits. Hence, Nephi applies Isaiah's words to the departed of his own people who, through the Book of Mormon, speak to those of the last days from the grave with a voice of warning. The phrase, unto him, power, means this appears to be a reference to Mormon, the great prophet editor of the Book of Mormon. Chapter 26, verses 17 through 19, the phrase, for they seek to destroy the things of God, meant the Nephites will write the things which have been done to them and seal them up in a book. However, they will dwindle in unbelief and not have the records because they seek to destroy the things of God. They shall be destroyed as a nation speedily, meaning at an instant, suddenly, meaning the destruction will come upon them quickly instead of a long, drawn-out war. Their destruction will come by the hand of the Gentiles. Chapter 26, verse 20, the phrase lifted up in the pride of their eyes means, that is, they are filled with pride and are important in their own eyes. Their eyes are not single upon the things of the Lord and matters of eternal consequences, but are riveted on the corruptible things of time. The phrase, the greatness of their stumbling block means, Blinded by pride, they stumble over the rock of their own ignorance. There is a darkness of mind caused in part by the loss of plain and precious things from the Bible. 
a phrase many churches put down the power of miracles of God meant, the number of different churches in society is inversely proportional to the knowledge of truth. The increase of churches opens the door to a profil pro proliferation of false doctrines. Further, the union of the un unilluminated results in reliance upon the arm of flesh and the mind of man. Mm -hmm. Those who study to be learned in regards to matters of faith and religion while rejecting the reality of revelation and modern revelators find themselves turning to naturalistic explanations for the works and wonders of the Almighty. The phrase, preach unto themselves their own wisdom, means those who preach up unto themselves are not unlike those who pray unto themselves. Neither category has God as the object of their devotion, and neither will receive the reward of him for their actions. Those who preach unto themselves desire to be heard of men are, in, are more concerned with the outward but fleeting plaudits than the unseen but everlasting compensation of the great judge. The phrase that they might get gain meant one of the core aspirations of priestcraft. See verse 29, to get gain, whether that's money or fame, recognition, whatever. To chapter 26, verses 21 through 22. In the last days, many churches will cause envying, strife, some malice. It would be a grave mistake to think this would not include some branches, wards, and stakes in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In other words, these verses aren't just to churches outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but these verses can also refer to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and some of our congregations. There are congregations among the two churches that are not unified as commanded by Moses 7.18 and contend with envy, strife, and malice among the members. The phrase secret combinations means there will be those who seek the destruction of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints through secret works enticed and given over to worldliness, thus sealing themselves to the God of this world, Satan. The phrase, he leadeth them by the neck with a flaxen cord, meant, while serving in the seventy, Carlos, Elder Carlos E. Essay explained how a flaxen cord is made and becomes a yoke of unbreakable op oppression. Quote, the first wrongdoings is like a single strand of flaxen thread, which is very fine like silk. It is easily broken and thrown aside. But each time the wrong is repeated, another strand is intertwined around the first, and on and on it goes, until an almost unbreakable cord of multiple strands is woven. The chains of habit, said Samuel Johnson, are too small to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. End of quote. The phrase, he bindeth them up with strong codes forever, means Enoch beheld Satan, and Satan had a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness. And he looked up and laughed, and his angels rejoiced. Brothers and sisters, could you imagine why would you give up your exaltation and happiness and joy to a person who laughs when people commit some of the most heinous crimes down here against each other? Satan laughs at all of that corruption and wickedness and sin. And yet people still follow that type of being. Verse 26, chapter 26, verses 23 through 28. God's purpose is to save all those who, who will be saved. It is an article of our faith that all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. No person was promised in premortality eternal life on an unconditional basis. And likewise, no soul was condemned as reprobate before the foundations of the earth were laid. Chapter 26, verse 24, the phrase, He doth not anything save it be for the benefit of the world, meaning how utterly inconsistent it would be for our Lord to advocate a plan of salvation intended to save only a portion of the children of the Father. 
the predestinarian doctrine of a limited atonement, the notion that Christ's atoning sacrifice is extended only to the elect, only to those chosen unconditionally in premortality, is false and damning to mankind. Rather, salvation is free, freely available to all who will receive it. God enrolls none of his children in the school of mortality who have not the capacity to graduate with full honors. That is, if we decide to seek that. The phrase that he may draw all men unto himself, meaning in 3 Nephi 21, 14 through 15, tells us how this will be accomplished. Quote, and my father sent me that I might be lifted upon the cross. And after that I had been lifted upon the cross, that I might draw all men unto me. That as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the Father to stand before me to be judged of their works. This is when they're resurrected, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And for this cause have I been lifted up. Therefore, according to the power of the Father, I will draw all men unto me, that they may be judged according to his works. We will all have to fear, appear before Jesus Christ and the Father because of Christ's atonement. 26 verse 25, the phrase, buy milk and honey without price, meaning the metaphor milk and honey is beautifully appropriate. Here, some of nature's most desirable foods symbolize that life's most desirable gifts are freely given. Chapter 26, verse 28, the phrase, All men are privileged to one like unto another, meant, Of a truth, Peter declared, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. He loves all of his children, but his love is not unconditional, in the sense of treating all of his children alike. Men and women are rewarded or punished according to their works. Indeed, even though the Lord esteemeth all flesh in one, as Nephi reminds us, he that is righteous is favored of God. That's why God can have favorites, because anyone can be a favorite of God if they choose righteousness. 26 verse 29, priestcraft. Describing a future day when priestcrafts would abound, Nephi said, For the time speedily shall come, that all churches which are built up to get gain, and all those who are built up to get power over the flesh, and those who are built up to become popular in the eyes of the world, and those who seek the lust of the flesh and things of the world, and to do all manner of iniquity, yea and fine, all those who belong to the kingdom of the devil are they who need fear and tremble and quake. The phrase, set themselves up for a light, means the Lord Jesus is the light. Men are at best mere reflections of that light. And then, I'm sorry, that should be then, not hen. And then, only when they are pure vessels, when the will of the servant is swallowed up in the will of the master, when the servants of God have their eyes single to the glory of God, others are able to acknowledge the good works as of divine origin, and thereafter glorify the eternal Father and his beloved Son. Such shall seek not a following, but companionship with fellow followers of their Lord and Savior. Christ is the central figure in the divine drama. For us to use ourselves as the example of the way, the truth, and the life is to upstage the Lord, causing a spiritual eclipse. We thereby block the glory of heaven's light. Quoting John 7, 18, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Christ is the only light that we should be holding up. We should not be striving to become a light in his church. Elder Russell, M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles added that priestcraft can occur both in the church and from enemies to the church. Quote, Therefore, let us beware of false prophets and false teachers, both men and women, who are self-appointed declarers of the doctrines of the church. 
and who seek to spread their false gospel and attract followers by sponsoring symposia, books, and journals whose contents challenge fundamental doctrines of the church. Beware of those who speak and publish in opposition to God's true prophets and who actively proselyte others with reckless regard for the eternal well-being of those whom they seduce. Like Nehor and Korhor in the Book of Mormon, they rely on sophistry to deceive and entice others to their views. They set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. End of quote. 26 verse 30, the phrase, all men should have charity. The antidote to priestcraft is charity, which Mormon called the pure love of Christ. Those who serve with charity do so with a pure heart, having no desire but to build up the kingdom of God and establish His righteousness. The charitable person is without envy, pride, or concern for personal honors. Charity is the anthem of Zion. Priestcraft is the psalm of Babylon, meaning the world. Elder Dallin H. Oaks counseled the church that, quote, it is not enough to serve God with all our might and strength. He who looks into our hearts and knows our minds demands more than this. In order to stand blameless before God at the last day, we must also serve him with all our heart and mind. Such service might be free of selfish ambition. It must be motivated only by the pure love of Christ. End of quote. 26 verse 31, the phrase, The labor in Zion shall labor for Zion. Mean. He who labor for that which is eternal shall receive that which is eternal. He who labors for that which is perishable shall perish. Keep my commandments, the Lord told the Latter-day Saints, and seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. Seek not for riches or any other motive of personal gain, but for wisdom, and behold, the mystery of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then you, shew, you, and then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. Further, if ye seek the riches which is the will of the Father to give unto you, ye shall be the richest of all people, for ye shall have the riches of eternity. And it must needs be the riches of the earth are mine to give. But beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. So it is up to the Lord on the riches that he gives to those whom he will. 26 verse 32, the danger of priestcraft is there is here associated with some of the most grievous of sins, all of which are antithetical to the spirit of Zion and thus lead to the destruction of the soul. 26 verse 33, the phrase, none of these iniquities come of the Lord, meant of the revelations of heaven it has been properly said that there is no unrighteousness in them, and that which is righteous cometh from above, from the Father of lights. The phrase, he doth not save it, be plain, meant though the challenges of life leave even the faithful saint with unanswered questions, there is no ambiguity about the principles of salvation. An understanding of the doctrine of his doctrines of salvation is equally available to all honest truth seekers. There is no inner circle of esoteric truths reserved for a chosen few. Further, no significant theological verity will be dependent upon a lone or obscured scriptural passage or little known interpretation. The phrase he inviteth them all to come unto him. Meant President James E. Faust of the First Presidency challenged us to set aside prejudice and to labor as brothers and sisters in the kingdom. Quote, I hope we can all overcome any differences of culture, race, and language. In my experience, no race, no class seems superior to any other in spirituality and faithfulness. Spiritual peace is not to be found in race or culture or nationality, but rather through our commitment to God and to the covenants and ordinances of the gospel. See, that's, end of quote, that's why Christ says, come unto me, because we are all different. We will not become one, all because we all choose to become one. No, we're too different. We all become one as we choose to become one in Christ. 
And so as we all seek to become one in Christ, then that draws us to each other. Elder M. Russell Ballard explained that the gospel blessings are for every one of God's children. Quote, Our Father in heaven loves all of his children equally, perfectly, and infinitely. His love is no different for his daughters than for his sons. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, also loves men and women equally. His atonement and his gospel for all of God's children. During his earthly ministry, Jesus served men and women alike. He healed both men and women and taught both men and women. For example, faith, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost are requirements for all of God's children, regardless of gender. The same is true of temple covenants and blessings. Our Father's work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of his children. His greatest gift, the gift of eternal life, is available to all. End of quote. Chapter 26, verse 33, the phrase, He remembereth the heathen, meaning all nations and peoples will ultimately have the opportunity to accept the gospel in its fullness. The phrase, all are alike, all are alike unto God, meant, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, Paul taught, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All are alike in regard, in regard to opportunities in matters of gospel possibilities. Persons will either have occasion to receive gospel gladness here, or else that privilege will be granted in the world of spirits hereafter. That is what will make God just and fair, that the gospel is preached even in the spirit world. The gospel and its blessings are to go to all races, nations, and lineages before the second coming. John foresaw that an angelic ministrant would bring again the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Of the gospel stored through Joseph Smith, the Lord said, And this gospel shall be preached unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Let's now turn to Second Nephi chapter 27 by way of introduction. The Lord shall do a marvelous work and a wonder. The last of Isaiah's writings, quoted by Nephi, Isaiah 29, reveals that many important prophecies of the restoration of the gospel in the latter days are missing from the biblical record. A careful comparison of Isaiah 29 and the same chapter from the brass plate, 2 Nephi 27, shows that some of the plain and most precious parts that have been taken away include one latter-day context of the prophecy, two, a book that Isaiah promised would come forth in the last days. Three, the book would be sealed. Four, roles of Moroni and Joseph Smith in bringing forth the Book of Mormon. And five, three witnesses who would behold the book and testify to the truth of the things therein. It is not hard to imagine that by removing these prophecies of the coming restoration, the adversary scheme to pervert the right ways of the Lord, that he might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. Notice how he got out some of the core things of the restoration. Chapter 27, verses 1 through 5. Nephi continues his prophetic message, which began, which began in chapter 26. His is a vision of the final period of the earth's history, the days of the Gentiles. It would be a dispensation of time wherein the fullness of the gospel would be delivered to the nations of the Gentiles through whom it would go to the house of Israel. It would also be a day of abominations, an era of intense opposition to the Lord and his latter-day church. And finally, it would be a day of spiritual emptiness, a time of famine for the word of the Lord. 27 verse 1, the phrase upon the lands of the earth meant Nephi expands to all the nations of the earth Isaiah's prophecy relative to the plight of Judah. His is a vision of universal apostasy, not just the tribe of Judah or the Jews of Judea. 22, 27 verse 2, the phrase, they shall be visited to the Lord, means, after the testimony of the Lord and those of his servants, after God has called upon the wicked to repent, after his legal ministers have lifted up the voice of warning to the rebellious and unbelieving, after all this comes the testimony of nature. 
How oft I have called upon you, the Lord said, and said to the Latter-day Saints, by the mouth of my servants, and by the ministry of angels, and by mine own voice, and by the voice of thunderings, and by the voice of lightnings, and by the voice of tempests, and by the voice of earthquakes and great hailstorms, and by the voice of famines and of pestilence of every kind, and by the great sound of the trump, and by the voice of judgment, and would have saved you with an everlasting salvation, but ye would not. God will use the voice of natural disasters to get us to repent and humble our hearts. And mankind will be stupid enough to call it climate change and seek to not turn their hearts to God, but think that they can control the God of nature themselves. What an arrogant world we live in to think that we can control the climate that God has created. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, shared his concern, shared his concern about the great problems in today's society. Quote, I know of nothing in the history of the church or in the history of the world to compare with our present circumstances. Nothing happened in Sodom and Gomorrah which exceeds in wickedness and depravity which surrounds us now. Words of profanity, vulgarity, and blasphemy are heard everywhere. Unspeakable wickedness, perversions, were once hidden in dark places. Now they are in open, even accord, legal protection. As Sodom and Gomorrah, these things were localized. Now the, they are spread across the world, and they are among us. End of quote. Chapter 27, verse 3. All the nations that fight, the quote, all the nations that fight against Zion meant... The great and abominable church is an organized social, economic, political, philosophical, fraternal, or religious which, which fight against the church of the Lamb of God or oppresses its practices or beliefs. The phrase, his soul is empty, meant in our day doctrines and philosophies of men proliferate, and yet among those who adhere to such views, men's heart remain unregenerated and men's souls unsaved. That which does not ultimately have the power to save does not presently have the power to satisfy. Religious views which originate with man are doctrinally deficient and incapable of satisfying the ravenous hunger of a spiritually starving generation. Only in the Lord's true church, only in that organization built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets and guided by the spirit of revelation are the bread of life and living waters available. The phrase, even so shall the nations be that fight against Zion, meant, as the phrase, mountain of the Lord's house, can properly be understood to apply to all temples, so the phrase, Mount Zion, can appropriately be used to refer to the gathering places of the saints. It is not without irony, irony that those who oppose truth and who fight against the Lamb of God in his church have precious little to offer in return to a hungry world. They who ravage the field, spoil the fruit, and trample the tent of Zion are then left without provisions. They must fend for themselves and face the bitter winds of the day and the darkness and cold of the night. Those who had raised the temples of the true believers are left without defense and without refuge against the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. They have poisoned the well they have poisoned the water in the well from which they too must drink. Many of church, Christ's disciples left him after his bread of life sermon, leading him to ask the twelve, Will you also go away? It was Peter as their spokesman who responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We feel to respond in the same manner to the many who would torch the kingdom with the fire of their wrath today and would turn us out of the true fold. To whom shall we go? What do they offer us in exchange for priesthood, keys, and sealing power? That should be sealing power. For a God who speaks, prophets who live, and the promise of eternal life. Sealing power. 27 verse 4, the fray that ye shall be drunken, but not with wine meant. 
Many who are without the fullness of the gospel, but who reject that fullness when it is available, wander in a stupor of sin. They are frequently among those who have imbibed the liquors of a licentious world and are intoxicated with immorality and idolatry and inebriated with apathy. Their vision is dim and their judgment faulty. They are without the living God in the world, having chose to live after the manner of that world. 25, ver 27 verse 5, the phrase, the spirit of deep sleep, meaning those who choose to reject the prophets and thereby spurn their living oracles sleep on long after the glorious dawn of heaven-sent revelation has brought an end to the night of apostate darkness and the vapor of ignorance and sin. In their pitiful pitiable plight, they have become comatose as to the things of righteousness. The phrase, the seers hath covered, the seers hath he covered because of your iniquity means, there was no first vision, no opening of the heavens, no beginning of a new and final dispensation until a faithful few on earth were ready for such a theophany. Seers are also revelators, and thus require listening ears to whom they can make known which, that which they have seen and heard. This verse applies to not just non-members, but to members of Christ's church as well. There are even those within the church who are deep asleep and have covered their eyes because of their iniquity. 27 verse 7, the phrase, shall be sealed, meant, after the brother Jared had seen a vision of things from pre-mortality to the end of the millennium, including all the inhabitants of the earth which have been, and also all that would be, a vision surely not unlike, if not identical, with those of Enoch, Abraham, Moses, John, and Joseph Smith, he was told to seal up the record in such a manner that could be read only by those to only by those to those the Lord should give the privilege. This vision of the brother of Jared, an account hidden from view, but a few of earth's inhabitants for over 4,000 years, is what is known as the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. Again, boy, I don't know how I got skilled. <clears throat> as the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon which is yet to come forth, brothers and sisters. Oh, I wish we would become more righteous so that we could get that, but it may not happen till the millennium. Mor Moroni edited the record of the Jaredites. He edited, his edited, his edited record became in what, that which we call the Book of Ether. Having read the marvelous things contained in a sealed portion, Moroni observed, I have written upon these plates the very things which the brother of Jared saw, and never were greater things made manifest than those which were manifest unto the brother of Jared. Wherefore the Lord hath commanded me to write them, and I have written them, and he commanded me that I should seal them up, and he also hath commanded that I should seal up the interpreters, the stones to be used for their subsequent translation, according to the commandment of the Lord." The phrase, in the book, shall be a revelation from God, meant, in speaking of the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explains, quote, John the Revelator saw in the hands of the great God a book sealed with seven seals. It contains, as our revelations tell us, the revealed will, mysteries, and works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth during the 7,000 years of its continuance or its temporal existence, each still covering a period of 1,000 years. As John saw, no one but the Lord Jesus, the Lion, the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, had power to loose those seven seals. This same or like knowledge is contained in the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. For aught we know, the two sealed books are one and the same. Of this much we are quite certain. When, during the millennium, the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon is translated, it will give an account of life in pre-existence, of the creation of all things, of the fall and the atonement, and the second coming of temple ordinances in their fullness, of the ministry and mission of translated beings, of life in the spirit world in both paradise and of the kingdom of glory to be inhabited by resurrected beings and many such like things. Oh, I'm not sure that's not hot. It's not the right word. End of his quote. 
beings of life in the spirit, both in paradise and and of the kingdoms of his glory. I'm not sure what the hot. But sadly, Elder McConkie has elsewhere written, written elsewhere, quote, the book is sealed as continents are being kept from men in this day. Indeed, it is not even now in the possession of mortals. It was returned by Joseph Smith to Moroni, its divinely appointed custodian. Nor did even Joseph Smith either read or translate it. We know of no one, no one among mortals since Mormon and Moroni who have known its contents. It was known among the Nephites during the nearly 2,000 years of their golden history. That should be the, not he. During the, nearly the 200 years of the golden era, but for the present the book is kept from us, only the portion upon which no seal is placed has been translated. Oh, I long for the day. Just think of what's contained in those scriptures. Why are these plates of Mormon sealed? The answer is obvious. They contain spiritual truths beyond our present ability to receive. Milk must precede meat. And whenever men are offered more of the mysteries of the kingdom than they are prepared to receive, it affects them adversely. End of Elder McConkie's quote. So we would be condemned if we were to get the book now because we're not ready to receive the doctrine in it. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, a quorum of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of scriptures yet to be revealed, especially those from the Book of Mormon. Quote, Many more scriptural writings will yet come to us, including those of Enoch, all of the writings of Apostle John, the records of the lost tribes of Israel, and the approximate two-thirds of the Book of Mormon plates that were sealed. And the day cometh that the words of the book, which were sealed, shall be read upon the housetops, and they shall be read by the power of Christ. And all things shall be revealed unto the children of men, which have ever been among the children of men, and which ever will be, even unto the end of the world. Today we, care, we, care, we carry convenient quadruple combinations of the scripture. But one day, since more scriptures are coming, we may need to pull little red wagons brimful with books. Oh, wouldn't that be such a great blessing? Chapter 27, verse 8. The book, the phrase, the book shall be kept from them, meaning the golden plates were not to be had by the world, nor even by those intent on determining the truthfulness of the claims of Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Spiritual verities are to be known by the power of the Holy Ghost and in no other way. The honest in heart are to read the words of the book, ponder them, and pray to the Father regarding their truthfulness. Further, they are to listen to the words of the Lord's servants, weigh those words, and prayerfully consider their source. Hereafter ye shall be ordained, Christ explained to Joseph Smith, and go forth and deliver my words unto the children of men. Behold, if they will not believe my words, they will not believe you, my servant Joseph, if it were possible that you should show unto them all these things which I have committed unto you, meaning the gold plates in the urn and thumb them. O oh, this unbelieving and stiff-necked generation, mine anger is kindled against them. Behold, verily I say unto you, I have reserved those things which I have entrusted unto you, my servant Joseph, for a wise purpose in me, and it shall be made known unto future generations, but this generation shall have my word through you. The counsel, therefore, to the Latter-day Saints and to all men is, Murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. 27 verse 9, the phrase, the book shall be delivered unto a man. The plates from the Book of Mormon was translated or delivered unto a man chosen from before the foundations of the world, Joseph Smith Jr. The phrase, he shall deliver the words of the book unto another meant, this is in reference to Martin Harris, who received some of the characters with Joseph, which Joseph had drawn off the plates. 27 verse 11, and the day cometh meant reference is here made to a millennial day, a glorious day, era when the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, when sin and wickedness will no longer 
be the order of the day when violence and oppression will have been cleansed from the earth by fire, and most appropriately when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. It seems apparent under all circumstances that the still portion of the Book of Mormon will not come until after the Lord Jesus comes. That's Brother McConkie's uh, opinion in the Millennial Messiah. In that day, a modern revelation states, when the Lord shall come, he will reveal all things, things which have passed, and hidden things which no man knew, things of the earth by which it was made, and the purpose and the end thereof, things most precious, things that are above, things that are beneath, things that are in the earth, and upon the earth, and in heaven. 27 verse 12, the phrase, three witnesses shall behold it. The Lord ordained the law of witnesses, explaining that law Paul wrote, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Thus, in the establishment of his latter-day kingdom, the Lord chose to share the burden of proof to spread the weight of testimony among more than his chosen prophet, Joseph. In speaking of future generations, and specifically to the seer of the latter days, Joseph Smith, Moroni wrote, And behold, you may be privileged that you may show the place unto those who shall assist to bring forth this work, and unto three shall they be shown by the power of God. Wherefore, they shall know of a surety that these things are true. I think it's in the history by his mother of Joseph Smith that when they finally showed the place to the three witnesses, Joseph was so relieved that he was not the only one now that was bearing witness of the truthfulness of the plates. In the course of the work of translation, Joseph Smith wrote, we ascertain that three special witnesses were to be provided by the Lord to whom he would grant that they should see the place from which this work, the Book of Mormon, should be translated, and that these witnesses should bear witness of the same. Almost immediately after we had made this discovery, it occurred to Oliver County, David Whitmer, and the aforementioned Martin Harris, who had come to inquire after our progress in the work, that they should have me inquire of the Lord to know if they might not obtain of him the privilege to be the three special witnesses. And finally, they became so very solicitous and urged me so much to inquire that at length I complied, and through the Yerman Tham, some of them I obtained of the Lord for them the following. Section 17 of the Doctrine and Covenants follows a revelation given to the three men whose testimony would accompany every copy in the Book of Mormon. In that revelation, the Savior said, Behold, I say unto you that you must rely upon my word, which if you do with full purpose of heart, ye shall have a view of the plates, and also the breastplate, the sword of Laman, the Urim and Thummim, and the miraculous directors which were given to Lehi while in the wilderness on the borders of the Red Sea. And it is by your faith that ye shall obtain a view of them, even by that faith which was had by the prophets of old. And after that you have attained and have seen them with your own eyes, ye shall testify of them by the power of God. Even though all of them at one time or another fell away, some came back, others, David Whitmer did not, but they, all of them testified of what they saw. They never ever went against that testimony. After the three witnesses, oh my goodness. <clears throat> After the three witnesses had been visited by the angel Moroni, after they had been shown the Book of Mormon place and had heard the voice of God bearing witness of the sacred record and commanded them thereafter to bear a like witness, the burden of Joseph the prophet was immeasurably lighter. His mother, Lucy Mac Smith, wrote, so here it is, what I was referring to, quote, when they returned to the house after their experience with the angel on the plates, it was between 3 and 4 o'clock p.m. Mrs. Mrs. Whitmer Mr. Smith, Joseph Smith Sr., and myself were sitting in a bedroom at the time. On coming in, Joseph threw himself down beside me and exclaimed, Father, Mother, you do not know how happy I am. The Lord has now caused the place to be shown to three more, more besides myself. They have seen an angel who has testified to them, and they will have to bear witness to the truth of what I have said. For now they know for themselves that I do not go about to deceive the people. And I feel as if I was relieved of a burden which was almost too heavy for me to bear. And it rejoices my soul that I am not any longer to be entirely alone in the world. End of quote. 
Upon this, Martin Harris came in. He seemed almost overcome with joy and testified boldly to what both had seen and heard. And so did David and Oliver, adding that no tongue could express the joy in their hearts and the greatness of the things which they had both seen and heard. Elder Donnelly Chokes gave the following insight into the three witnesses' powerful testimony. Quote, the three men chosen as the witnesses of the Book of Mormon were Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris. Their written testimony of three witnesses has been included in the most of all the most one million copies of the Book of Mormon the Church has published since 1830. These witnesses solemnly testified that they had seen the plates which contained the records and the engravings which are upon the plates. They witnessed that these writings had been translated by the gift and power of God, for his voice hath declared them to us. They testify, we declare with words of soberness, that an angel of God came down from heaven, and he brought and laid before us our eyes, that we beheld and saw the plates and the engravings thereof. And we know that it is by the grace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ that we beheld and bear record that these things are true. End of quote. 27 verse 13, none other save view it, save it be a few. The eight witnesses, Christian Whitmer, Jacob Whitmer, Peter Whitmer Jr., John Whitmer, Hiram Page, Joseph Smith Sr., Hiram Smith, and Samuel H. Smith obtained a view of the plates near the Smith home in Manchester. It was on the occasion of the prophet Joseph Smith coming to Manchester from Fayette, accompanied by several of the Whitmers and Hiram Page, to make arrangements, arrangements about getting the Book of Mormon printed. After arriving at the Smith residence, Joseph Smith Sr., Hiram Smith, and Samuel H. Smith joined Joseph's company from Fayette, and together they repaired to a place in the woods where members of the Smith family were wont to hold secret prayer. And there the plates were shown to these eight witnesses by the prophet himself. The phrase, as if it were from the dead, meant the Lord, in speaking through Joseph of old, told of a day when Mormon would write the words of those who had slept. And the words which, have, which he shall write shall be the words which are expedient. My wisdom should go forth into the fruit of thy loins. And it shall be as if the fruit of thy loins had carried them from the dust, for I know their faith. 27 verse 14, as many witnesses as seemeth him good. Wherefore, Nephi taught by the words of three, specifically Isaiah, Nephi, and Jacob, God has said, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth more witnesses, and he proveth all his words. 27 verses 15 through 20, the phrase that he may show them to the learned. This is referring to Isaiah spoke in cryptic language words which have special meaning to the Latter-day Saints, a people who have lived in the days when the prophecies of Isaiah have come to pass, and that the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. That's Isaiah 29, 11-12. The latter-day fulfillment of this prophecy is recorded by Joseph Smith as follows, quote, In the midst of our afflictions, we found a friend and a gentleman by the name of Martin Harris, who came to us and gave me $50 to assist us on our journey to Harmony, Pennsylvania. Mr. Harris was a resident of Palmyra Township, Wayne County, in the state of New York, and a farmer of respectability. By this time, aid was I able to by this timely aid was I able to reach the place of my destination in Pennsylvania. Immediately after my arrival there, I commenced copying characters off the plates. I copied a considerable number of them, and by the means of the Urim and Thummim, I translated some of them, which I did between the time I arrived at the house of my, father's, my wife's father in the month of December and the February following. Sometime in the month of February in 1828, the aforementioned Martin Harris came to our place, got the characters which I had drawn off the plates, and started with them to the city of New York, for which took place relative to him and the characters. I refer to his own account of the circumstances. He related them to me after his return, which as follows. So here's what happened to Martin Harris in New York. 
I went to the city of New York and presented the character which had been translated with the translation thereof to Professor Charles Anthon, a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. Professor Anthon stated that the translation was correct more than any he had before seen translated from the Egyptian. I then showed him those which were not yet translated. He said that they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyric, and Arabic, and he said they were true characters. He gave me a certificate certifying to the people of Palmyra that they were true characters and that the translation of such of them as had been translated was also correct. I took the certificate and put it into my pocket and was just leaving the house when Mr. Anthony called me back and asked me how the young man found out that there were gold plates in the place where he found them. I answered that an angel of God had revealed it unto him. He then said to me, let me see that certificate. I accordingly took it out of my pocket and gave it to him. Then he took it and tore it into pieces, saying, There was no such thing now as ministering angels, and that if he would bring the plates to him, he would translate them. I informed him that part of the plates were sealed, and that I was forbidden to bring them. He replied, I cannot reseal the book. That's a duet quote from Isaiah. Can you imagine that? Thousands of years before it happened, and God got a prophet to give a direct quote of Professor Anthon. Man, tell me that Christ knows all things and he knows the future. That is prophesying that you can quote exactly what will be said thousands of years in the future. I left him and went to Dr. Mitchell, who sanctioned what Professor Anthon had said respecting both the characters and the translation. 25 verse 15, the phrase, take the words and deliver them to another. Here is the prophetic word which attests that Martin Harris's trip to New York was based upon more than his own curiosity or desire for academic substantiation for the Book of Mormon translation. Joseph Smith was commanded the Lord to send another Martin Harris to New York. The phrase show them to another was Charles Anthon was indeed a learned man by the world standards. He was a professor of classic Greek and Latin at Columbia University in New York. 27 verse 16, because of the glory of the world to get game. Before I read this, let me mention, I don't think Charles Anthony could have translated anything. I think he was lying through his teeth that he knew that, this was, that those characters were translated correctly to Martin Harris being. It was out of his pride that made him say that. I'm not sure that some of the, this was Reformed Egyptian, so he didn't have a clue. He was lying. 2716, the phrase, because of the glory of the world and to get gain, meant this phrase identifies Professor Anthon's motivation. Further, it seems apparent that Anthon, although certainly a noted scholar in his day, was stretching the truth to suggest that he could translate the golden plates. According to Martin Harris's account, a learned professor indicated that the translation of what Moroni called Reformed Egyptian was the most correct translation he had seen. Yet the work of Champollion, the French genius who broke the Egyptian language code through the Rosetta Stone, had not yet made its way to the United States. Anthon could not have known how to translate Egyptian antiquities. So what a liar and a fraud. Neil or Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, explained on a singular event with Professor Anton to include the general reaction of the learned of this world to the Book of Mormon. Quote, this is not solely a reference to Professor Anton since the plural pronoun they is used. The reference suggests a mindset of most of the learned of the world who, by and large, do not take the Book of Mormon seriously. Even when they read it, they do not really read it, except with a mindset which excludes miracles, including the miracle of the books coming forth by the gift and power of God. End of quote. 27, 17 through 18, I cannot read a sealed book meant. This has reference to when Professor Anthon asked to see the place, the book, so that he could translate it. Where Martin Harris tells Professor Anthon he cannot bring the book because it is sealed. To which the learned Professor Anthon replies, I cannot re-seal, read a sealed book. It is amazing how Nephi, by the spirit of revelation, gives us the very words that would be said before this meeting ever took place. Thus we see the omniscience of God who knows the end from the beginning. That should be no's instead of no. 
27, verse 19, the phrase, him that is not learned. This refers to Joseph Smith, one whom the God of heaven and earth chose to, to immerse in the mysteries of the universe, was by man's myopic standards unlearned. The phrase, I am not learned, meant the Palmyra seer, like so many of the prophetic colleagues, meaning Joseph Smith, felt unworthy and ill-prepared to accomplish so great a task. But it is through such persons, men and women, ever sensitive to their limitations, who trust in him who is able to transform weakness into strength, their mighty things are accomplished. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. That man should not counsel his feather man, neither trust in the arm of flesh, but that every man might speak in the name of God, the Lord, even the Savior of the world, that faith also might increase in the earth, that my everlasting covenant might be established, that the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. That is one of the great, mighty evidences, brothers and sisters, that the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, is true, and God's only true and living church on the earth, that it was through weak and simple souls who trusted in him that all of this has brought forth and has continued to roll forward, and no one has been able to stop it. 27 verse 20. The phrase, I am able to do mine own work, means it would be delightful if kings and presidents of the world over were to announce in regal splendor that God has spoken anew in this final dispensation. It would be helpful to missionaries, cause of preachers, evangelists of all persuasions, or to bear witness of Joseph Smith and the work he set in motion. And it would be glorious indeed if linguists and archaeologists, and anthropologists and scientists without number or to establish empirically what the Latter-day Saints have been saying about the Book of Mormon for over a century and a half. Such occurrences, however, do not appear to be on the horizon of possibility, at least not until the Lord returns in glory. But such things are not necessary, at least they are not necessary for the Lord. His work will move forward in humility and with quiet dignity. The simple but profound testament of thousands of Mormon missionaries and faithful members of the church will continue to be born to all the world and to be received by honest truth seekers. The Lord is able to do his own work in his own way, and his way is not man's way. And we live in those glorious times. Eleanor Neal I. Maxwell spoke of how the Lord will ultimately overcome all objections to his work. Quote, God lives in an eternal now where the past, present, and future are constantly before him. His divine determinations are guaranteed since whatever he takes in his heart to do, he will surely do it. He knows the end from the beginning. God is fully able to do his work and to bring all his purposes to pass. Something untrue of the best laid plans of men since we so often use our agency a mess. End of quote. In an earlier setting, Elder Maxwell also noted that God fulfills purposes, fulfills his purposes without nullifying the agency of man. Quote, because the centerpiece of the atonement is already in place, we know that everything else in God's plan will likely finally succeed. God is surely able to do his own work. In his plans for the human family long ago, God made ample provision for all mortal mistakes. His purposes will all triumph and without abrogating more man's moral agency. Moreover, all his purposes will come to pass in their time. End of quote. 27 verses 21 through 22 regarding this little portion of the Book of Mormon. The reading of the sacred portion is to await that day of righteousness when the truths contained therein may be shouted from the housetops, that day when God shall reveal all things to the children of men. 27 verse 21, the phrase, In my own due time, Elder Nell A. Maxwell discussed our timing and God's timing. Quote, Faith also includes trust in God's timing, for he has said all things must come to pass in their time. Ironically, some who acknowledge God are tried by his timing globally and personally. End of quote. We must constantly learn in God's timing. May we be able to say not only thy will be done, but thy timing 
be done. And that requires faith on our part. On another occasion, Elder Axel said, Faith in the timing of God is able to say, uh, Thy timing be done, even when we do not fully understand it. And that can be hard. 27 verse 22, the phrase, The words which thou hast not read, even Joseph Smith was not permitted to read from the vision of the brother of Jared. 27 verse 23, the phrase, I am a God of miracles. God has the power to reveal all truth to man, the power to make all things known from the beginning to the end, even those mysteries contained on the record of the brother of Jared. God is the omnipotent one, a being of miracles, who is able to convey verities and perform acts which are beyond the power of mortal man to comprehend. But he is also the omniscient one, and knowing perfectly the thoughts and intents of all his creation, is able to discern who is ready to receive that work. The phrase, I work according to the faith, means it is by faith that miracles are wrought, Mormon taught his people, and it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, woe be, woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. 27 verses 24 through 35. In verses 24 through 35, Nephi appears to be quoting from the brass plates the passage we know as Isaiah 29, 13 through 24. These words evidence that Isaiah saw our day, witnessed the erection of the glorious gospel standard that ends into the nations among the Latter-day Saints, and acknowledged that such a restoration was indeed a marvelous work and a wonder. 27 verse 24, the phrase shall say unto him words that shall be delivered. The hymn, the hymn referred to in this phrase means Joseph Smith. And I shall say unto Joseph Smith, words that shall be delivered to Joseph Smith. 27 verse 25, the phrase, this people draw near unto me with their mouths meant. In other words, with worn out and empty praise, they praise me. They put forth catechisms and creedal statements which deny my very essence. In speaking of the churches of the 19th century, the risen Lord said to the boy prophet Joseph Smith that they were all wrong and that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight. And those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for the doctrine the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The phrase, their fear towards me, is taught by the precepts of men means... It is as if the Lord had said through Isaiah, their, profess, their professions are but verities and vulgarities, improper, for their conception of me is faulty and perverse. Their knowledge of me derives not from the rock of revelation given by those whom I have spoken, but rather from the philosophies of men. 27 verse 26, the phrase of marvelous work and a wonder means, a work of the restoration is both marvelous and wonderful. In our day, in our final dispensation of grace, shall the, work, shall the Father work a work, Jesus taught the Nephites, which shall be of great and a marvelous work among them. And there shall be among them those who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. The phrase, the wisdom of their wise and learned shall perish, meant all the wisdom and learning of man fade in obscurity and insignificant when compared with one jot of revealed truth, one tittle of pure intelligence. A library containing the wisdom of man is not of equal worth to a single sentence uttered by the power of the Holy Ghost. When those who are learned also trust in God as the source of their knowledge, they apply their hearts to understanding and thereby become possessors of wisdom. That means they make righteous application of truth. Too often, however, those who see themselves as wise are in reality foolish. They are ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. 27 verse 27, the phrase, seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord referred to. The phrase is originally Isaiah's. The Hebrew word sod, usually translated as counsel in the King James Version of the Bible, may also be rendered a secret as in Amos 3.7. That is, those who seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord are those who try desperately to hide their secrets, their secret acts from him, who sees and knows all things. Such, of course, is ludicrous and impossible. Their work 
works are works of darkness, but they are clearly visible to the God of glory. The phrase, you're turning of things upside down, referred to, one of the claims made by Latter-day Saints, as also against Paul and the early Christians, is that they are turning things upside down, meaning, of course, that they are stirring up the beans and minds of people, disturbing the traditions of the fathers, causing the people to consider the message of the truth. The Lord's response is simple and forthright. I know all their works. For ye shall say of him that made it, he made me not. For shall ye say of him that made it, you made me not? The Lord God is affirming that the spiritual revolution set in motion through the restoration of marvelous work and wonder is of divine origin. God himself brought it to pass. This is compared to a potter and the clay shaping the pliant clay, remodeling the imperfect vessel until, the conformed, until they conform to his ideal. God reveals the manner in which he is able to mold at his will the nations. 27 verse 28, the phrase Lebanon should be turned into a fruitful field, refers to, as a proof of the divine power and an interest in human affairs, Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field. The fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. That is to say that fertility and productiveness of the country will be so great with the blessings of God that there will seem to be no difference between a natural forest and an artificial park. All will have the appearance of a well-cultivated garden. This has been corrupted in our day. In less than 25 years, the actual development of Palestine agriculturally, commercially, and intellectually is the marvel of history. The Jews in Palestine, as the Latter-day Saints in America, have literally turned a desert into a garden. They have brought money, knowledge, idealism, and the type of people settled there is the best human material available for the building up of a country. 29, 27 verse 29, the phrase, shall the death hear the words of the book, meant the plainness of the Book of Mormon brings hearing to those who have not yet heard, sight who have not yet seen. The pages of this ancient volume are filled with solemn and sacred sounds, with bright and brilliant rays of light. Those who pretend not to hear and not to see the inspiration of the Book of Mormon will awake to the effect of it on the world. They will realize the out, that outside the revelation of God, there is spiritual darkness. There is only light within God's revelations. 27 verse 3, the phrase, the meek and the poor shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel, meant the meek and the poor, the unencumbered by the vanities of men, those who are eager and earnest in their quest for eternal life. These are they in the latter days who shall glory in the message of the restoration, who shall rejoice in the testimony of the Holy One of Israel set forth by the Book of Mormon. 27 verse 31, the phrase, the terrible one, is brought to naught, meant the tyrant who has accused and persecuted men for a word, an allusion to unjust and harassing lawsuits, if word in Hebrew, debar, is understood to mean a legal statute. The phrase, all that watch for iniquity, meant the Lord here condemns all those who are ever alert for the opportunity to do evil. 27 verse 32, the phrase, an offender for a word, lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, meant the gate was a place of public meeting and thus became a convenient place for the administration of justice. Princes and judges would sit at the gate and discharge their official duties. The Lord here, condemn, the Lord here condemns those seeking to misuse or abuse his words and those whom he has sent, making the innocent an offender for a word. The Lord has warned, Cursed all those that shall lift up their heel against mine anointed, saith the Lord. And cry they have sinned when they have not sinned before me, saith the Lord, but have done that which was meet in mine eyes, and which I have commanded them. But those who try transgression do it because they are the servants in sin, and are the children of disobedience themselves. 27 verse 33, the phrase, the Lord who redeemed Abraham, refers to. Commentators note that there is no reference in the Old Testament to any incident in the life of the patriarch to, re to which this redemption can refer specifically. 
But in the book of Abraham, the Pearl of Great Price, I think we find the story of the redemption of Abraham to which Isaiah 29.22 and Nephi here refer. According to the book of Abraham, the Egyptians had an altar and a religious establishment there. Just as, for instance, America in our day have churches and congregations in some of the principal cities of the world, such as London, Paris, etc. The paternal relatives of Abraham, it seems, have turned away from the religion of their ancestors and were worshipping pagan idols, and especially the divinities of Egypt. They even delighted in the sacrifice of children. Then a time came when the priest of Pharaoh seized Abraham and tended to take his life on the altar. But when he lifted up his voice to God, the angel of God's presence appeared, unloosed the bands of the intended victim, promised him the priesthood, and declared that through the ministry, through thy ministry, meaning Abraham, ministry, my name shall be known in the earth forever, for I am thy God. Then the Lord broke down the altar of Elkanah and the gods of the land and utterly destroyed them and smote the priest that he died. The country must have been visited by some unusual calamity, for the record says there was great mourning in Chaldea and also at the court of Pharaoh. It was thus that God redeemed Abraham by almighty power and taught him one of the lessons that enabled him to become the father of all that believe. 2733, the phrase Jacob shall not now be ashamed meant, no longer will the people of Israel hang down their heads in sorrow. No longer need the children of the covenant wander in the world devoid of identity. The restoration represents the beginning of the Father's work in the last days, the work of gathering. Israel can now loose herself from the shackles of her scattered state and put on her beautiful garments. She can once again enjoy the power and blessings of the holy priesthood. 27 verse 34, the phrase, sanctify the holy one of Jacob, meant to sanctify the holy one is to reverence the God of heaven through true and proper worship. It is to serve the Lord in righteousness and truth, something that can only happen after Israel is restored to the true knowledge of their God. 27 verse 35, the phrase, they that erred in spirit shall come to understanding meant the marvelous work and wonder which is the restoration shall sweep away theological cobwebs, the abomination of man-made creeds and mistaken notions concerning God, man, and the purpose of existence. The phrase, they that murmured shall learn doctrine means people murmur when they know not the dealings of that God who created them. Those, on the other hand, who have received the everlasting gospel, have basked in the light of its doctrines, have participated in the ordinances of salvation, and live so as to enjoy the gifts of the powers of the Holy Spirit. These gain that elevated perspective which allows them to know the truth of, as God knows it and live the faith as Christ lived it. Such have entered into the rest of the Lord. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and have come to better appreciate the words of Isaiah and Christ in the, and, and, and the omnipotence of Jehovah in being able to tell us of the future and those things which would happen and that they literally came to pass. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.